look, so fellas, fellas, fellas. Okay, I just started hitting the record button. And before we got into it, Eugene was telling me how he got on a shirt and tie. So if you're listening to the audio, you don't know what we're talking about. But if you're watching the video, he got on a suit and a tie. He's suited and booted. I'm sitting here with my sweatshirt on, you know, chilling at the crib or whatever. But one of the things that he mentioned was he woke up, he got dressed. He was like, yo, this is a special day, right? His 11-year-old and his wife, everybody was like, dude, what's going on? Is something special going on. And he just said, it's a new day. So I felt like putting a tie on today just to, to, to shake things up. And so before we even jump into the intros and the shout outs and all of that, that kind of stuff, what led you to think that today was something different, something special? What was that thing? What was that inspiration inside of you, brother? My great question, man. And thanks for having me on, brother. Uh, man, I, I love new beginnings. I love fresh starts. I love new seasons. Today's Monday. It's been a rough, it's been a rough season for all of us these mm -hmm. past couple of years. And so something on the inside of me just said, you know what, Gene, you're going to another level. It's time to do things differently. It's time to sharpen up your focus. And so I said, you know what, if I'm going I'm to be a success, I might as well dress like success, Mike. So that's a little bit of the the motivation there. <laughs> Look, it's a new day. I'm to new beginnings. I'm all about reshaping, refocusing, you know, rebranding, all of that, that kind of stuff. It's like, it's a new day. So therefore I need to put on a new suit. And that's exactly what you did. And who I'm talking to and who you heard, just drop a little snippet of his story. is my man, Eugene Schneeberg. It's Schneeberg, right? Got it. Perfect, brother. There you go. Look, I, you know, I'm looking at the spelling. It's Eugene Schneeberg. And my man, he's a husband. He's a father. He's an author. And I'm going to tell you, it was interesting. When we had a conversation not long ago and he started going into his story, I told him to stop because I wanted the same discovery process that you all are going to have in hearing this brother's story. But he's an author of a new book. I never met my father, my journey from fatherless to fatherhood. I mean, but dude, when I say like brother was like doing work in the Obama administration, he was doing this, he was, we'll let him walk through his journey. But fellas and ladies listening to because y'all tune in to try to figure out how we think, right? Uh, let's welcome my man, Eugene Schneeberg. What's up, brother? Like, man, I'm so excited to be on Block Fathers now, man. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the work you do, and I'm just really grateful to be on here with you today, man. Um, the work you do to lift up voices of Black fathers is so important. I really believe that fathers are the foundation of the family. And so I think there's no greater investment that we can make than investing in fathers. So just so grateful to be here with you today to talk about my new book, man. I never met my father, my journey from fatherless to fatherhood. Uh, man, it's been a wild ride. I've been looking for my biological father for almost 30 years. Mm. Uh, when I was growing up, I never met him. Um, I, I began asking my mother about my father kind of when I was old enough to really think about it, right? Like, you know, you're growing up, your reality is dad's not in the home. So it's normal to you. There comes the point in time where you, you start to ask questions. You start to see other people's fathers. You start to see fathers on TV and you're like, hold up. <laughs> Um, and that's what I did. I asked my mom um, and she basically told me she didn't know my father well. Um, they had connected. He had recently came back from the Vietnam War. Um, they had connected for a brief amount of time and then they went their separate ways. And she found out she was pregnant. Um, he came around. She actually ended up having me. He came around about a year later and uh, knocked on her door and uh, they hadn't seen each other in a year. And during that time, she had been pregnant and had me and I'm like two months old and he knocks on the door. She opens the door and um, they're both surprised. And she says, well, I got something to show you and brings him back. And here I am in the, in the crib. She says, surprise, this is your son. And he's, he's a little taken back, you know, and he says, wow. And he tells my mother, well, man, I want to help however I can. My, my sister just had a baby last year. She still has some baby clothes. Maybe I can help you out with that. Now, I just want to pause there to say my mother had already had two children before me. Ray, or was raising um, them by herself, and including me. Um, and so raising, raising children by herself wasn't a new concept. In fact, she didn't know my, my father very well. And in her mind, she didn't, she didn't know him well enough to trust him. Mm. And uh, so she made a, a calculated decision that week that, you know what, um, I, don't, I don't know this guy well enough. And uh, she basically told him, man, thanks, but no thanks. 
and uh, you can keep the baby clothes and, you know, just kind of keep it moving. And so uh, that was the last time, uh, you know, my mother called a few more times. Eventually, my mother kind of stopped picking up his calls and moved to another apartment. This is in the late 1970s. There's no Google. There's no Internet. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the last time they saw, saw one another. And that was 43 years ago. I'm 44 years old. Um, and so fast forward now, I'm going to ask my mother about my dad. And, uh, and she tells me his first and last name. Very common first name. Very common last name. My first thought was at eight, nine years old, um, let me look in the phone book under his last name, which is Graham. So I open up the phone book to Graham. Some of your, some of your viewers and listeners don't know what a phone book is, Mike, but it's this <laughs> big book with a bunch this of names thing, and phone numbers. You had to open up with a lot of pages, yeah. yellow and white pages. Yeah, yellow yeah, yeah. and white pages. So I open up the phone book and there are hundreds, if not thousands of Grahams in the city of Boston where I was raised. And so as let's say I was 10 years old, I just froze with, with anxiety. Like, man, I, I imagine calling one after another, after another, just to be rejected, to be told, I don't know what you're talking about. You're crazy. And I thought, man, I couldn't, I could never do that, you know, hundreds of times, let alone if I did find the right family, what would I say? You know what I mean? At 10 years old. And so I never, I never, until much later, never made any phone calls. I just kind of suppressed those feelings. Um, and, and as a son, my, I didn't want to hurt my mother. I could kind of tell it was hard for her to tell the story, even as a young, young man. And I think some of the, the men watching this will understand that, that sons never want to hurt their mothers. And so as I would ask over the years, in the subsequent years, um, I, I could tell it, it bothered her, it hurt her. And so I would just, I would try and pick and choose, you know, um, stick and move, like ask for a little more detail, but not too much. And then she used to give me like, if you do find him, don't hook up with him in person because he might kidnap you. Mm. And so these seeds of kind of fear and, and so forth was kind of planted. But anyway, long story short, um, I never really in earnest reached out to him till I probably was in my 20s to really try and find him when I kind of got my courage up. Um, and the internet had been invented at that point. Mm -hmm. and reached out to, a, actually called a couple grams from the, from the uh, phone book, reached a couple with his with his name. They kind of told me politely, no, that wasn't them. It was awkward. Imagine calling a stranger and saying, hey, I'm looking for dad? information. Are you my father? And they're like, uh, who are you? You know what I'm saying? Um, and that continued for many, many years. Buddies of mine saw how, how kind of important this was to me, threw some money together, and hired a private investigator for me on my behalf. Man, that, that moved me so much. Powerful, man. Hired a private investigation firm, they came up with no luck. They said, hey, I don't have enough information. We didn't have a middle name, a social security number, a, a date of birth, none of that pertinent information. My mother didn't know him that well. All I knew was that he was served in the military, he was about six foot three, uh, African-American brother, had a jerry curl, Mike. That was a very important piece <laughs> of information. I had a jerry curl in 1977. Anyway, um, so this journey continued. I kept praying and all the while, God was kind of, um, making it clear to me that this was somehow he was orchestrating this for my good. And after reading a book by Dr. Miles Monroe on vision and purpose, I got clear that really my purpose was, was to help strengthen fathers and to help um, restore and strengthen families. And part of my pain was actually leading to my purpose. And so um, I ended up working for the Obama administration. And, and my, I guess where I ended up working, working on his, the president's fatherhood and mentoring initiative. Helping wow, hold on, hold on, Paul, 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 Paul. Like, okay, <laughs> so you, cause you mentioned something and I, I definitely want us to go back to it. You mentioned you didn't want to hurt your mother, but in reality, you were kind of hurting yourself in the process. So it's kind of like you assumed that pain or that hurt because you didn't want to put that on your mother because, you know, as a son, you didn't want to do that. But what's interesting, that is something like sacrifice to an extent, which mm -hmm. when we stop and we think about fatherhood now, what is it that we do day in and day out if we're present in the lives of our children and our wives and, and all of that is we sacrifice, right? We right. sometimes hide things 
from them and we take on burdens. And, and again, this is a challenge because, you know, now that we know better and we do better with therapy and, and all of that, but mm-hmm. for so long, you know, we have broad shoulders because we're supposed to, or we felt like we're supposed to carry these burdens. And so it's interesting how this led you down this journey of empowering fathers, of helping fathers, of working with fathers on a global scale, right? But from the jump, you were actually, like you just mentioned, you recognize your, you found your purpose in this. You were being groomed for that by taking on burdens, which fathers inadvertently have to do as the head of, of households and, you know, in leading families. But before we jump into that, I, I want to take it back because usually when we start, I always have the brothers give shout out. So before we jump into your journey, cool. your story, I like for you to give some shout outs to those individuals who are kind of the wind beneath your wings to allow you to be who you are to then inspire this amazing journey that we're about to jump back into in a second. Give me a few shout outs, but then let's let's jump back into this journey, brother. Absolutely. Uh, all right. Shout out number one has to go to my mother, uh, Hannah Schneeberg, 80 years old this year. A uh, remarkable woman, uh, you know, experienced a lot of trauma in her life and but was able to raise my sister and I by herself. And uh, without her, man, I, I certainly wouldn't be where I am today. Uh, so definitely shout her out. Uh, she's a major part of the book. Shout out to my amazing wife who we uh, met when I was 15 and she was 14. And we've been together almost 30 years. Wow. Uh, man, she is, uh, you talk about wind beneath wings. She, that's it. Uh, her strength, her conviction really helps uh, helps me day in day out and uh, raise our four children so shout out to ej 16 genesis 14 elijah 11 and franklin 4 um and then shout out to my uh my father-in-law who passed earlier this year who was really my first example of a loving husband a loving father and i watched him love on his wife love on his six biological children their adopted son and the dozens of foster children that they raised in their household. And uh, in many ways, I've modeled, you know, my, my view of what a father looks like and what a husband looks like after the late, great Pastor Warren Collins. Mm-hmm. Brother, man, you, you got, you literally, when you say wind beneath your wings, you got like a typhoon beneath your wings, right? The way that you, you know, these inspirations, these stories, these individuals that are here that allow you to carry and do the things you're doing on a very high level. And so kind of jumping back into your story, you know, you mentioned that this pursuit of your father, this pursuit of a father in your life growing up was in essence, this basically the the staking of what, who you were to become as you evolve, as you grow and as you become, you know, the man that you're supposed to be in life. But then you mentioned it led you down this path of working with fathers and with the Obama administration, you were now part of working with fathers on a national or even a global stage, right? Talk to us a little bit about that journey, what your role was and and the impact and things that happened there. Absolutely, man. Well, after I graduated from Boston University in my early 20s, my first job out of college was at a juvenile detention facility, working with kids that were locked up. And uh, to be honest, man, when I was growing up, I had it rough growing up without a dad, you know? So um, I had, I've been robbed, I've been shot at, I've been jumped, my house been broken into, all kinds of stuff. Felt really vulnerable as a, as a teenager. So anyway, when I got the opportunity to work at this juvenile detention facility, my first thought, if I'm being really honest, not politically correct, I said, do I really want to go work with these bad kids? The, kid, the types of kids that had taken my lunch money and, mm. you know, jumped us and all that other stuff. Mm. But when I actually got in there, I was 100% wrong. These weren't bad kids. These were kids that just lacked opportunity, lacked you know, positive influences in their life reminded me so much about myself. And they taught me so much as a 21 year old working with these 14 and 15 year old young men. And that totally changed my life, totally changed my career trajectory where I went on to work for a faith-based nonprofit in Boston, helping young people when they're released from these facilities to get jobs back in the school, match with mentors and, and reduce uh, gang violence. After doing that for several years, um, I landed on the radar of the Obama administration where they essentially recruited me to come to DC to help um, support their youth violence prevention work and to to expand their work to engage faith-based organizations. So I came down to DC. Uh, I I never thought I would, but um, prayed about it and got open the door. 
and I ended up serving as the director of the Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships at the Department of Justice. So hmm. amazing opportunity to work with some of the leaders in the 100,000 you know, uh, person Department of Justice under the first African-American Attorney General Eric Holder. Uh, my immediate boss, uh, the Assistant Attorney General has a, had a two and a half billion dollar annual budget. Just learned so much about how government works and work to make sure that um, what I had learned kind of cutting my teeth doing this work in nonprofit circles was able to kind of translate. So by the time I left after six years, we had um, conceptualized and put into practice um, new grant opportunities totaling about $30 million to support uh, fathers who are incarcerated and their children. Um, recently released young people from juvenile facilities. We had expanded the administration's youth violence prevention work to 30 cities and helped them implement violence prevention strategies. So man, it was a wild ride. I learned a lot. And during that time, I did have an opportunity to be invited to serve on President Obama's fatherhood initiative. In large part, you know, Mike, um, President Obama only met his father just a few times. And so that's a huge part of his story. He empathized with the plight of millions of young people who were raised without their fathers. And so what, a, what an amazing opportunity to help advance that work. Um, the administration funded about $75 million to fatherhood programs every, so, every few years and was able to support that. And then when I left the Obama administration, I continued to consult and work to um, continue to promote responsible fatherhood. So that's what I, I feel strongly called to do. My, my life's passion is kind of at the intersection of young people involved in the juvenile justice system, helping them to have more opportunities and make better decisions. And then this issue of fatherhood, which I think is so closely aligned. Let me just, I'll say this and then I'll pause. I was talking with a retired police chief a few years ago. And when I told her what I did, she said, you know what, I've been in law enforcement for 30 years. And she said, the single most determining factor with those who come in contact with law enforcement in the criminal justice system and don't is those who have their fathers at home. And it just blew my mind that she was that candid and that straightforward. And I've seen that play out time and time again as I've gone into prison after prison. And you can just see that the overwhelming majority of those men and women in there really had either no relationship or a bad relationship with their father. So if we really wanna stem the tide of folks entering into the criminal justice system, again, I think the biggest investment we can make is the strengthening fathers, equipping them and giving them the tools they need to, to be in their rightful place in their, in their families and their households. Ooh, dude, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, it's um, as you were talking and you're probably familiar with his work, um, and it's a book called The Boy Crisis. Have you, are you familiar yeah. with the boy crisis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Yeah, Brother Pharrell. Yeah, mm -hmm. Brother Pharrell. And so what's interesting about it is in his book, he really highlights the direct correlation between um, basically father or dad deprived boys and incarceration and gangs. Uh, he even correlated on a global sense. He was just like back in the day, the young men who were recruited to Hitler youth were dad deprived boys. Uh, the men, you know, as far as those that get caught up in various, you know, extremist organizations and, and terrorism scenarios were typically dad deprived boys. Um, and so he termed it dad deprived boys, not necessarily they were fatherless, they were just dad deprived. So maybe a dad was there, but they, I mean, a father was there, but they, it was the, the interaction was not fruitful. And even yeah. goes back to what you were talking about a second ago, where it's not just about having a dad there, it's having a dad there and having a proper relationship. Because like you mentioned, and you threw a caveat that some people tend to overlook, they just think dads need to be there, but it's like they, dads need to be there, but dads need to be there and have the right type of relationship, you know, with the child. And so there is a direct correlation with your work. And it's interesting how it all comes full circle. Again, if you stay out the way and you stay present, you stay open and obedient to that thing that's flowing through you. And you and I know what that thing is, right? Like when the Holy Spirit speaks to you and it's flowing through you, if you're obedient to that, you know, your gift will make room for you. And sometimes your gift is wrapped in pain. And that's what's interesting about your story. The pain of not having your father was in essence the wrapping of this gift to then help others to not necessarily have to experience that pain. Absolutely, man. I, I, I can't underscore, Mike, what you just said enough. If you really look at most of our society ills, and I'm, I am familiar with the boy crisis and 
corresponded with him this week, so it's funny you brought it up, but and a lot of the issues we deal with are rooted in the pain associated with broken families. And a lot of times, the, the, unfortunately, the, the source of that brokenness ends up being kind of a, either a longing for a deeper relationship with dad or a disappointment or an anger, or resentment, all kinds of stuff. I mean, at, at, at the family unit core, you have a father and you have a mother who is designed to raise and bring up children. I mean, that's as fundamental as it gets going back to the very beginning. And when one of those elements is out of place, but a dad's not there or mom. Unfortunately, Mike, you probably are seeing this as well. A lot of moms are now out the picture. A lot, a lot of the opiate crisis and a lot of drug situation. I meet a lot of single fathers raising dads by themselves. And the issues related to motherlessness are even deeper. We haven't even begun to scratch the surface of what that looks like when the abandonment and the, the emotion that comes with that. But the, I meet so many people who have this deep, deep woundedness. Uh, one statistic says nine out of 10 individuals have a carry a father wound. And my goal is to reduce that number significantly. My goal is to, to make sure that nine out of 10 don't have a father wound, right? That, that have a loving, connected relationship with their fathers. There's no perfect fathers, just like there's no perfect mothers. Uh, fathers aren't better than mothers and mothers aren't better than fathers. I'm not here to point the blame at anyone. I'm here to work collectively with my sisters and my brothers to help strengthen families. And I'm grateful that your show and your work really is a significant contribute to that. Mm, my man. And, and so you, you work with the Obama administration and then you moved into continued work with regard to the intersection of like fatherlessness or, you know, empowering fathers and criminal justice reform and, and working with individuals that were impacted by the criminal justice system, you know, kind of carry us forward with some of the things that you were, you know, involved in and some of the things that you did, you know, which ultimately got you to the point of, you know, now becoming a published author and speaker and panelist. I think I saw a picture with you with, with T.D. Jakes and all that stuff recently and, you know, doing your thing. Talk to us a little bit about what happened next, man. Yeah, and you, you talked about the, the the spirit flowing through you. And, um, you know, I would be remiss to say, like, you know, my life would, would be jacked up if it wasn't for God in my life. That, that was probably the single biggest thing that changed my life. But, you know, I really try and stay in my lane, right? I think when you know what you're called to do, it makes it easier to say no to a whole bunch of stuff, right? Because um, there's a lot of good stuff out there. So that's my lane. Fatherhood, criminal justice, fatherhood, criminal justice. And unfortunately, the criminal justice system um, inherits a lot of people who are victims of brokenness, right? Um, and so I, I like to work myself out of a job. I like to work to be so diligent and so collaboratively with people like you, Mike, that so few people even enter the criminal justice system that there's really not a much need to even do that work anymore. But because um, fathers are really the greatest protective factor in the lives of their children. Um, so I would do a lot of work with human service agencies, um, you know, uh, social service agencies, uh, fathers who have children and involved in the child welfare system, the foster care system, dads who are on child support. Um, uh, fathers who are involved in Head Start and, and the like. But, um, and then I also work with churches and other organizations to help support young people when they're incarcerated. Um, I do work on the National Responsible Fatherhood Clearinghouse, and our mutual friend Kenneth Braswell on fatherhood.gov to help um, promote resources and, and around fatherhood as well. So, man, it's, it's all kind of one and the same for me. Um, the more we do to strengthen families, the less I think need will, will be put on these systems to kind of help patch up broken families. You know, if we can, you know, in, in the public health sector, they say, if you can go upstream, you know, instead of trying to take the babies out the, out the river one at a time, go upstream and figure out who's throwing the babies in at the first time, like stem the tide. And so um, I believe by, by working with um, young people before they even become parents, um, by changing the narrative and the culture in, the, in our society around fatherhood and, and relationships and, uh, and marriage, right? A lot of brothers, Mike, if, you, if we're honest, we know a lot of brothers that are a little scared to get married, or some sisters that are scared to get married. And, uh, you know, I've been married almost 20 years. I'm a big advocate for marriage. I think it's God's design to safeguard us and safeguard our children. And uh, so, man, I'm, I'm just trying to work to change culture change people's mindsets about families, about fatherhood and about marriage. 
man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw something. You, you dropped the gym, and I hope um, the folks listening did not miss it. And you mentioned if we go upstream a little bit, right? See, when you think about a stream, a, a stream flow, it goes downstream, right? So it goes from one place to another place. And a lot of times what we do is we go downstream and try to catch what's coming from the top of the mountain and rolling down. Whereas brother Eugene said, if we can just go upstream a little bit, we might be able to get to the root of the problem. And, and the reason I said that is this. So, you know, I have connections with and community with a lot of brothers in a lot of spaces. You know, one of my line brothers is a chiropractor and one of his his uh, and he's an upper cervical chiropractic. So basically he focuses not on adjusting your whole spine, but adjusting the atlas, which sits right below the base of your skull. And the theory of his, you know, manipulation is if he gets the atlas right, it's kind of like when you hold a chain that has a kink in it and you shake it a little bit from the top, the rest of the chain ends up straightening out. That's the theory behind how he operates. I have another brother, man. This is a really good friend of mine. He's a strength and conditioning coach for the New York Knicks. And one of the things that he mentions when he does an initial evaluation is he has these athletes. Now, these are the top athletes in the world. He said they take their shoes off and I look at their feet. I just have them do simple squats and walking because I can then look and see what's off. And a lot of times, one of the things we think that there's something wrong with your calf, but it's really something on your left shoulder that is out of alignment, that's pulling on this, which is tweaking that, which causes you to walk a certain way, which is causing a strain in your calf on the right side of your body. But most of us go straight to the calf and we want to hyper focus on the calf and diagnose the calf. But what Brother Eugene said, and this is a gem in life, sometimes you just got to go upstream a little bit. What some might call it in the, you know, the new, the new terminology is like first principles thinking, right? You get back to the root and you basically weed away, take away all the stuff that's on the surface and you get back to the core components and you start building from there. And what you might find is these 12 issues that we're having in society could be fixed if we go upstream and fix this one thing. And that one thing now flows downstream and we no longer have these issues that plague us. It's a gem, brother, drop. Don't, I hope y'all didn't miss that because brother Eugene dropped a gem. Oh man, I appreciate that brother. And yeah, that's, that's what the book's all about. Um, you know, I give advice to young men and young women who aren't yet parents, aren't yet fathers and mothers about what to consider before you, take that plunge, right? Um, you know, I talk about a lot of mistakes I made um, as a young person um, and, you know, try and, 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 and give opportunities for young people to, to make those good decisions so they don't have to deal with a, a world of pain and hurt. Because I deal with so many couples that I just have this antagonistic relationship, this adversarial relationship for years over raising their children. Um, and it's just, it's just so sad to see. And so, and then I give advice for first time fathers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you remember back to when, when you first had your child, you know? Um, and so a lot of people think, Mike, that my book is only for fathers. They're like, oh, I wanna give this to my nephew. I wanna give this to my son. Um, but the book is really just as much for mothers and daughters as it is for fathers and sons. And I know Mother's Day is coming up. I don't know when your listeners will hear this, but. Mm -hmm. uh, man, I think there's great stuff in there for single mothers raising children by themselves. I hear that quite a bit. You know, I'm raising my son. I'm running into issues with him. What, do, what should I be doing? So there's some good insight in there as well, as well as for, for experienced fathers, right? About less, I think we can learn a ton from my mistakes. And so I just share really openly and honestly about some of the struggles I've had as a dad, as a husband. I certainly don't get it right all the time. And I try and be as transparent and vulnerable as possible about lessons I've learned, raising teenagers, raising infants, raising newborns, dads raising daughters, dads mm -hmm. raising sons. Um, so man, I think your listeners are gonna enjoy the book. I'm, I'm excited about them reading it. Man, dude, I I'm gonna tell you, um, insight is so needed and perspective is needed. And I appreciate the fact that you're sharing your story and your journey because a lot of times when 
you know, when it comes to quote unquote advice, I'm using air quotes here, advice, you know, folks are like, all right, you know, there's a skepticism there because all right, well, who are you? Where do you come from? Are you sitting on a high horse? Are you waving your finger at me and telling me what I should or shouldn't be doing and all of that? That to me hits totally different from someone sharing their story. Because when you share your story, you're actually offering an olive branch saying, look, you know, and I use a quote all the time that perfection is not a requirement for greatness, right? We're all imperfect beings. You know, CeeLo Green had a title of, a, of an album, CeeLo Green and His Perfect Imperfections, right? Like the only thing that's perfect about us are our imperfections, right? That's the thing that we have to recognize. And that's cool. And I think it gives people the ability to have grace in their lives when you understand that a brother like Eugene Schneeberg, who's worked with the Obama administration, sat on the National Fatherhood Board and has been a part of billions of dollars in funding going around the world to do this and do this for fathers and, you know, building families and working with criminal justice. Even a brother like this is imperfect as it pertains to being a father. So I appreciate your transparency there because I think a lot of times we have aspirational figures meaning we see somebody on IG or we see somebody on TikTok or on the TV or a movie and we just think, oh, their life is so perfect or they're just so this because they're in this position or that position. But one of the things that I like to share and why I love having these conversations is, yes, I got brothers like yourself who are super accomplished, who literally could probably on their phone call some folks that fo it would take other people six months to schedule, schedule a meeting with an assistant of an assistant of an assistant to get there, right? But even brothers like yourself are open about the fact that I'm imperfect and it's okay. You're yeah. never going to be perfect because I'll never be perfect. And guess what? It's not needed. We just got to be great. And perfection's not a requirement for greatness. Yeah. You brought up something so important, Mike, man, which is this um, sense that as men, that we, we somehow have it all together or somehow that we don't hurt. And I talk a lot in my book about um, how is men and how I've benefited from learning from other men, how to express the full range of my emotions. Um, how oftentimes as men, we have a hard time getting in touch with um, like crying, for example, you know, I know, you know, my brother, Jason Wilson from Detroit, who wrote a powerful book, Cry Like a Man, talk about that in the book and how um, so many of us think it's weak to cry or to express sadness. Um, but I really talk about in the book how it's actually a strength to be able to be fully present, fully in touch with the full range of your emotions. Or even sometimes, you know, when we were coming up, don't be a punk, don't be soft, don't act like a girl, like, you know, all those things. But it, it doesn't, it, it's not, it's not uh, feminine to, to just be in touch with who you are in terms of, and there's things that come on a daily basis that try and cause me to have concern, fear, sadness, anxiety. And if we're not in touch with it and we don't have a healthy way to express it, oftentimes we suppress it for so long then it just explodes. And it, most times it comes out as anger. And so I run a lot of groups with fathers and that's the main thing is getting to a place where we're safe enough, we trust one another and where we can be vulnerable. I missed it, man. I, I raised my voice at my wife yesterday. I, I, I was short tempered with my daughter the other day you know, at work, I, I missed it here, I missed it there, you know, I'm feeling anxious about this, I'm, you know, I, I think I might be depressed, like, therapy is great, and I encourage everybody to get therapy, but we need circles with other men where we can just be really open, honest, and vulnerable with one another, so I talk about it in the book, and I just encourage anyone to listen, man, to find you a, a circle of support where you can be as real as you need to be, and, um, you know what I'm saying, I, I heard somebody say recently, you're only as sick as your secrets, and so, man, we want to be a place where we can just be open, honest, and vulnerable. And I try to do that in, in my book. Mm. Brother, I'm, I'm going to throw something in. It's interesting. As you were talking, you talked about, you know, um, just the, like for us, expressing our emotions as men and the challenge of doing so. And part of that is the vulnerability associated with it, right? But it's interesting. I was thinking about like on safari when you see a lion, right? A lion in the middle of the day can sleep wide, just sleep in the open, right? Peacefully. But when you think about like a gazelle or you think about something that has to always be, you know, heightened with a heightened sense of awareness, 
they can't just lay down and sleep in the open peacefully. If they do, they have to have other people watching them or whatever. And so when I thought about that concept and you were just talking, I was actually thinking about the premise that men who can be vulnerable and express themselves are actually the men that are actually the most powerful. Because when you are powerful, when you are someone who's very much assured in who you are, you don't mind crying because you're like, yeah, and, right? You think about this. It's like when you are at a certain level of wealth, I no longer have to put on designer clothes and show everybody what I have because it's like, dude, it's there. I don't have to prove anything to anyone anymore. I'm comfortable. So to me, the most emotionally vulnerable individuals who are willing to express themselves are actually the strongest because they realize it's like that lion that sleep in the middle of the pre of the savanna, right? <laughs> nothing is covering them, nothing is blocking them. But I wish you would walk up on that lion, <laughs> you, and and he knows that, so therefore he can rest in peace. Yeah. Whereas the gazelle or that thing that's a prey has to be heightened and they can never sleep soundly. They can never be vulnerable. So it's just yeah. like, as you were talking, I think we have to start reshaping this whole narrative of emotions are connected to weakness, mm -hmm. but actually emotional vulnerability is connected to strength because only really strong individuals have the awareness, the ability to be emotional pretty much wherever they want to go because they're like, dude, I ain't got nothing else to prove to you. Yeah. And a lot of times we just, we're not aware of it, Mike, because that narrative, you know, when we're, when we're raising our boys and they start to cry, man, man, stop crying, you know, stop acting like a girl, stop acting like a baby. So we internalize that, that, oh, if I cry that somehow I'm, I'm a baby or I'm feminine or whatever, I'm weak. So we just don't allow, it's just subconscious, not even aware of, it, we just don't allow it. I explained this to a group of about 30 incarcerated uh, fathers just the other day. And in like 15 minutes of explaining the concept, they were able to go from this kind of tough guy mentality to a place where they were willing to, to go to hurts and the things that they wrestle with. And one of the biggest things that we, most of us wrestle with, Mike, that's unaddressed is this issue of resentment and unforgiveness towards our father. So I have a chapter in my book called Forgive Your Father, Forgive Yourself. And I think that's one of the hardest things to do is to, if there's, if there's um, issues with our father, to forgive our fathers is very difficult, but it's very necessary and it's very possible. That's one of the biggest things I had to do was forgive my father. For years, I carried this weight on me and it just weighed me down emotionally and physically and spiritually of, of anger and resentment. Why wasn't he there? Why didn't he come find me? Why haven't you been looking? I'm looking for you. You know you got a son. Where are you? You know what I'm saying? And just this raw emotion, it was so tiring. And when I was finally able to let it go and just say, you know what, I forgive this man. I want the best for him. I don't understand fully his story, what his relationship was with his father, the hurt and pain he's gone through, and how most of the stuff is generational. When I was able to finally release him, release any resentment I had towards my mother, then I could sleep soundly into that point about that lion. Now I get good night's sleep because I, I took that weight off, you know. And I challenge anyone listening how important it is for you to release and forgive. If not for your father, do it for yourself. You know, they say unforgiveness is like uh, drinking poison and hoping that it hurts the other person. You're really just hurting yourself, man. So, so do it for yourself. Release, forgive. I give some practical strategies in the book and how you can go ahead and do that. And trust me, it will make you make you an even better father to your children because you're finally able to get over that hump and be able to explore really what went on with you and your feelings and your emotions. If you don't address that in you, unknowingly, you pass on a lot of that stuff to your children subconsciously. Ooh. Ooh. Man, look, as we kind of wind this thing up, like, like, and you've given some snippets of this, but specifically, man, how has this journey come full circle to impact you personally as a husband and a father? Yeah, so, um, Personally, just being as real as I can, you know, I have four children. I've never met my father. And, and I talk about later on in the book, I don't want to give it away. My yeah, journey. Don't actually, give it all away. We're going to buy Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you want to read chapter nine, how the story ends. Um, but 
for me personally, that that pain and that insecurity that I experienced as a young man, not knowing my dad, not feeling valuable enough, not knowing do I look like this man, what characteristics did I get from him, I believe that subconsciously I developed this drive to do, 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 accomplish, do more, succeed, grind, hustle. Um, and I, I masked it with like, well, I got to provide for my family. That's what a lot of us kind of workaholics do. I got I got to provide for my family. But no, it was it was beyond the norm, right? And so grinding, grinding, grinding. And then when I had children, I expected them to grind at the same pace. Grind, grind, grind. Don't come home with B pluses. Don't come home with A minuses. Like I, I literally would tell my children, they come home with A minuses. Like, well, why wasn't it an A? I had to realize like, how sick is that? Like high expectations is one thing, but being overcritical is a whole nother thing. I had to learn to affirm them for a B plus or a B minus for that matter. Um, if they, you know, all my kids play ball. So if they would score 12 points in a game, I would say, man, you could have scored 20, man. You, mm -hmm. you know, blah, blah, blah. And I had to learn, like, my journey's not their journey, right? I have to love them the way they are. And when I began to understand that and began to, to realize that a lot of that was trying to please, to prove that I was good enough to this father that I had never met, I had to slow down and just say, you know what? I'm loved just the way I am. If I never accomplish anything else, if I never get promoted, if I never, you know, do all any any additional accolades, I'm loved for who I am right now, not because of what I do, just for who I am. And so I had to learn that about my children, that I love them for who they are, not be based on what they achieve on the court or in the classroom or what have you. So um, that was big for me. And that came at the same time when I was able to release my father, when I was able to realize through this journey of writing this book that, um, you know, I need to be as healthy as, and as strong as I can, as present as I can to love and affirm my children while I have them in my household. I got a sophomore in high school, man. He's going off to college in a few years. I remember I blinked and he was, you know, he was in the delivery room. And so, man, I don't want to miss these years. Um, you know, I want to be present. I want to love on them. And so this book, man, is, is um, my attempt to, to, um, to make sure that as little children as possible have to go through what I went through, right? I want as many children to know the love and affirmation that a father has, the safety and the security of having your dad present with you. And uh, my, my hope and prayer is, as I know it is yours, Mike, that, that more men have the opportunity to do what they were created to do and more children have the opportunity to experience the love, the unconditional love of a, of a father and a mother. Man, I heard I am enough. Like, I am enough. And, and fellas, ladies listening to, I hope you all recognize when you look in the mirror that you are enough. It's not what you do. It's not your accomplishments. It's not the this, the that. It's the I am. And I am is enough. And, and that's the thing that a lot of us lose sight of. And for us as a family, you know, I don't get mad at my kids for bad grades. I don't get mad at them for, you know, not getting a hit in the baseball game or not winning the track meet or whatever. I don't get mad at that. The only thing that gets under daddy's skin, and they'll tell you, is poor attitude and poor effort. As long as your attitude is fine and as long as you give a great effort, I don't care about the outcome. See, I'm, not, and that's the thing for me as a father that I've had to evolve and grow into because society pushes you down in, you know, down the pathway of the outcome. It's the outcome, it's the outcome, it's the outcome. But the reality is we have no direct control over the outcome. The only thing that we can control is the input, not the output, right? And that's something that as a parent, you know, my kids are gonna follow their own path and I'm here to enhance the journey, to direct them, to show them the way to model and, you know, show them how I treat my wife and how, you know, all of that stuff, we have to model these things. But the reality is we celebrate when they're nice people. We celebrate when they do something kind for someone. We celebrate when they work really hard. And if that working really hard results in a C or the top grade in the class, I don't care. I just want to know that you worked hard and you gave your best and you brought the right attitude to the table. And so I hope you listened to what my man Eugene mentioned about he recognized that he was enough. Once he released his father from the bondage of, of resentment and he forgave, 
he recognized that he was enough, and that then spilled over into him as a husband and a father. And all this you can catch in his book, I Never Met My Father, My Journey from Fatherless to Fatherhood. Um, and now where can the, where is the book available? Where can folks grab it? Um, and also like social media and everything, how can folks follow you and get more insight from you, brother? Yeah, absolutely. So the book's available at I, I never met my father.com. That's the website. You can go on there. You can purchase it. We'll ship it out to you. You can put a little note in there. If you want me to autograph it or sign it, or you want to give it as a gift to a father in your life or a young person in your life, or as I said, mother's day is coming up. It's a great gift for moms as well. Uh, well, this but is yeah, actually going to release the day after Mother's Day, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, May 16th is so you know, as folks know with podcasts, I mean, unless you're doing a live release, we record them and then release them later. So we're yeah. recording prior to the release date, but this yeah. will be live in its yeah. full form on May the 16th, Monday, May the 16th. Awesome. So it's a great, it's a great a retroactive Mother's Day. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but also leading up to Father's Day this year, which actually is on, on Juneteenth, on June 19th. Come on. Great Father's Day. Uh, you can follow me on um, Instagram at repjc247, repjc247365. Um, on Facebook, just Eugene Schneeberg. Um, and uh, the, the best place to go is www.inevermetmyfather.com. And you can pick up a copy. We're, we're excited for you to read it. Um, I pray people say that it's a it's a quick read. A lot of people actually have read it in one sitting. So a lot of people say like, oh, I, I'm busy. I don't have a lot of time. It's a quick read. It's not long. And just make sure you got your tissues ready because a lot of people uh, talk about how it really it evoked a lot of raw emotion for them as they read it. Mm. Well, brother, man, I, well, first off, before we finish, we got to give a shout out to our man, Jackson Drungle for being the the bridge connecting the dots here and um so thanks jackson shout out to my man for for linking this up he was just like mike there's this brother you need to meet i'm gonna put y'all on a text thread y'all take it from here and man it, it's yeah i i was just like yeah brother you brought you brought a hit on i i appreciate you so thank you to jackson for linking us up man yeah it's a good brother man it's a good brother there's a lot of good a lot of good of good ones out there and i'm and that's another thing man there's so many great fathers out there shout out to the fathers listening we get a bad rap man there's so many extraordinary fathers that i met that just love and care for their kids and uh so grateful for each father listening and so grateful for each mother listening the extraordinary uh, sacrifices that mothers make oh uh, man i'm grateful for an amazing mother that i have and that my my children have an amazing mother as well awesome 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 well, Eugene, I salute you, my brother. Keep up the doggone good work, man. You're impacting lives. You're in your lane. You're not staying in your place. You're staying in your lane. So you're flowing in the direction that you're supposed to flow, and you're allowing that thing that's flowing through you to get out to the world, and I appreciate you for it. We're all going to be better for it. Y'all, make sure to visit inevermetmyfather.com. Inevermetmyfather.com. Grab a copy of his book hit him on social media, link up with the brother. If you don't know about him already, let him know you heard about him on Black Fathers Now and, um, and continue to encourage him to keep letting this thing flow through him because his story is going to help somebody else, but allow that to inspire you that your story can help somebody else as well. And so brother, thank you so much for your time. And as always, y'all follow Black Fathers Now everywhere on social media, um, share this episode out. And until next time, y'all be blessed, well, and wise. And I holler at you. Peace.